Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. PacWest, First Horizon, and Western Alliance lead another slump in bank shares, unable to shake concerns about the sector's viability. European stocks and U.S. futures actually point higher as traders prepare to scrutinize today's payrolls report for signs that the labor market pressure continue to ease. Plus, German factory orders fall the most since the pandemic as manufacturing continues to drag more than other parts of Europe's largest economy. Now, first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. And again, it's a very heavy markets day. We look at German factory orders, how that weighs on the ECB. We look at the U.S. jobs data. But actually, the big question is, if the ECB, and if you listen to what Christine Lagarde said yesterday in the press conference, the fact that inflation is not out of the woods, and so she will continue keeping it under control, there's going to be a divergence between what we heard from the Fed just moments earlier and what we heard from the ECB. Now, history says that it's very difficult that markets will push to play that divergence. So if you look at U.S. monetary policy, it's also always been King Fed. Does that change? That's probably the question of the month. Iron ore, one of the other stories that we're watching out for because it is putting pressure on some of the commodities, uh, you know, stocks, rich stocks, some of the basic resources, stock from the miners, iron ore down 1%, and then you can see crude oil 1.7% higher. So let's also look at uh, some of the differences, if we have any, but actually there's not a huge difference. Uh, we're seeing all the sectors across the board gaining. I think insurance is the one that's gaining the least, but it's still on the way up. But you can see the FTSE, uh, four tenths of 8% higher. Remember, on Monday, there was a bank holiday post-coronation, so you're not going to see much movement on that Monday. The DAX and the FTSE may have been Italy gained between four tenths and eight tenths of a percent. The other story, of course, that we're following very closely, some of the U.S. regional lenders. Uh, we are heading into a weekend, so there could be things. We had, of course, a, a long chat with our banking experts saying that it's usually at the weekends that you find solutions if you have problematic anything, especially problematic banks. And then the question when you look at PacWest Bancorp, is it, is it really shielded to the rest of the world? For the moment, it seems that it is. Now, for more on all of this, our expert, he writes great columns that everybody understands, and they're also usually quite fun and funny, Bloomberg Opinions, Paul Davies. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so you focused from, you know, from Credit Suisse, now you have these U.S. regional lenders. And we thought it was over with J.P. Morgan, you, you know, buying that failing bank. But now we're, we're back in this turmoil. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a situation that we see uh, again and again where the market investors are hunting for the next weakest link, really. They're kind of, you know, pushing yeah. against, um, you know, who might have issues, who might have profitability problems, who might have, you know, assets, you know, interest rate related problems and just, I guess, seeing if those links will break. Is there, so is there a bigger question about if a lot of these U.S. regional banks get, you know, get taken out, what the U.S. banking system looks like? So are we just creating more problems if you just have huge banks? Well, uh, I mean, I guess that's one way of looking at it. I mean, I think if you are, you know, J.P. Morgan at this point, you're... What you're saying is, look, we're big, we're diverse, we're stable, we're here helping to solve the problem by being able to, you know, uh, pick up and look after some of these, um, you know, struggling banks. Uh, but, I mean, you know, the U.S. still has thousands and thousands of banks. We've got this story about how, you know, the, the FDIC, the insurance um, uh, body that sort of, you know, that, that, that looks after depositors is going to work out how to charge all of the banks to refill the fund. And any bank under $10 billion doesn't have to pay, probably. That's 4,000 banks, right? I mean, there's, there's still a lot of institutions in the U.S., a lot of very small ones. But there's a lot in the mid-range as well. Well, and, and what you're very good at is, is really unpacking and distilling some of the differences between these banks. Like, PacWest is not SVB, right? But you talk about the net interest margins. Again, if, if the markets keep on testing, like, what's the end game at some point? I mean, do they just test everyone? Well, I guess you, you test things until they stop breaking, essentially. Right. So, and that could happen in several ways. That could happen just because these banks, after all, are you know, strong enough and profitable enough and stable enough to withstand the pressure that the market is putting on them. Uh, or it could happen because the Fed, the Treasury, you know, has to in some way step in and do something different that sort of you know, stops the fire, as it were. Yeah. So when we had SVB, then it had repercussions in, in other parts of the world. 
are you fairly confident? I mean, this is a big question, so I am putting you on the spot. But you know, given what we know so far, are you fairly confident that this is, is contained to the U.S.? So obviously, we have seen Credit Suisse for the rest of Europe, uh, which I've been looking at more closely. You know, we haven't seen yet any of the same kinds of strains that we've seen in the U.S. But we had, you know, results this week from BNP Paribas and from Unicredit, and what both of those showed was there was a bit of drift in deposits, and Andrea Orchell talked about this on his call with analysts, from smaller banks to larger banks. There is a little bit of a, you know, a flight to safety starting to happen, but only in a very, very small way. But there, are, there just aren't the same kinds of strains in Europe for several reasons. One is you know, interest rates haven't risen as much, uh, QT hasn't run as far, quantitative tightening hasn't run as far, deposit levels uh, are just starting to decline a little bit for the system as a whole, not anything like we've seen in the US. And also all European banks, unlike in the US, are regulated to the same degree that the very large ones are. They all have to monitor and report on the interest rate risks in their books and, and things like this. So, you know, touch wood, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a much more stable looking situation for now, at least anyway. All right, Paul, thank you so much. As always, Bloomberg Opinions, Paul Davies. Now, the other story, of course, apart from the U.S. region, I mean, we have many stories. We have the U.S. jobs, we have German factor orders, but in terms of corporates, we have the U.S. regional banks, and then, of course, we're looking at Apple. So I think we're just starting to have a pre-market gain 2.4%. Now, the story there is, of course, uh, the chief executive focusing on India, maybe more than China, but it is also a relief. Now, they were reported um, earnings that were a bit better than expected. It's still a dip, I think 2.5% lower to the previous quarter, but actually it's a relief for investors because we had Qualcomm, one of the suppliers, just saying a couple of days ago that the situation was pretty dire, and that's not the message we got from Apple at all, that share price 2.4% higher. Now, as expected, the ECB has raised rates by 25 basis points. It's the smallest hike yet, but President Christine Lagarde says it's far from the last move for the central bank. Everybody agreed that uh, increasing rate was necessary, that uh, second, we are not pausing, that's very clear. Third, we know that we have more ground to cover on the basis of the baseline that we had, which is still guiding us until we have our next projection exercise. Well, joining us now is Constantine Veit, a portfolio manager at PIMCO. Constantine, thank you for joining us. When you look at the pitfalls of monetary policy, first of all, are traders and markets just going to push back against the ECB to see whether they can really diverge from the Fed? Good morning to you. Um, I think the ECB is right to emphasize they're not Fed dependent and they're in a different stage. If you look, for example, where uh, the core inflation rates are in both jurisdictions, which are pretty similar, versus the policy rates, which are not that similar. So I think it's, it makes sense that the ECB communicates that it expects there is more ground uh, to cover. So what does that mean, Constantine, on how you want to construct your portfolio going forward? I think overall, if you look at uh, the yield levels, they're obviously radically different compared to what we've seen a while ago. We've been in negative rates for a very long time, in uh, particularly in Europe. Um, we are now uh, at much higher rates, so there's obviously a way more constructive backdrop for fixed income. On the other hand, there are still a lot of risks out there. And the good news is you don't have to take a lot of risks, both interest rates risk and credit risk uh, these days, to get a good yield uh, on your investments. So we prefer the front to medium part of the interest rate term structure and also in the more credit sensitive segments we certainly have an up in quality bias. Uh, Constantine, when you look at, and, and this is something that we saw in last week but then it's subdued, if you look at the difference between BTPs and German bunds, is that, I mean, is there going to be a lot more anxiousness and if you put that into context we also had some pretty dire German factory figures today. I would argue that uh, the spread between BTPs and bonds has been reasonably resilient uh, since the ECB started its hiking cycle. Um, it certainly helped that uh, uh, the government in, in Italy tried to be uh, reasonably constructive when it comes to the, to the institutional setup. Um, it also helped that the ECB made very clear that they're monitoring fragmentations uh, very closely. 
So overall, the spread has been reasonably stable since the ECB started its, its hiking cycle. And also, when you looked at the announcement yesterday, where they communicated an end to APP reinvestments from July onwards, the spread hasn't really moved much. So we don't see an immediate catalyst one way or the other, and accordingly don't have a, have a big position there uh, currently. So what's your biggest position? I don't know whether you have a, a very you know, bold call on treasuries or on, on dollar that, that could actually change people's thinking. I think given the risks that are out there, particularly on how quickly, for example, core inflation will uh, uh, kind of come back to the central bank target over time, I think it's prudent to be reasonably close to home and not particularly exposed. Um, so there are still pockets of opportunities out there, for example, in, in uh, European swaps. We think they have room to converge to core government bond yields uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Also, when you look at RV type of trades, for example, when you look at uh, the swaps in the US versus the swaps in Europe, where in forward space they trade pretty much close on top of each other. So there is also room to play some RV there. So uh, we look at more from a bottoms up perspective and, and we emphasize a little bit the big macro calls at this stage. All right, Constantine, thank you so much. Uh, Constantine Veet, their portfolio manager at PIMCO, stays with us. Coming up, the apple of Tim Cook's eye. we see what we've done there. We look into bumper earnings as a tech giant announces a buyback following buoyant iPhone sales. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, sales of Apple's iPhone rebounded last quarter, helping the world's most valuable company top earnings estimates. The tech giant made more than $51 billion in sales from its flagship product, the iPhone, helping it weather an industry-wide downturn that has battered much of its product lineup. Well, the chief executive officer, Tim Cook, singled out India as pivotal for Apple. India is an incredibly exciting market. Uh, it's a major focus for us. Uh, I was just there, and the dynamism in the market, the vibrancy is, is unbelievable. There are a lot of people coming into the middle class, and I, I really feel that India is at a tipping point. Well, joining us now is Aggie Cantrell, our tech reporter in Berlin. So, Aggie, iPhone, good morning. iPhone sales really drove the, venue, the revenue. What's the key takeaway? Good morning, Francine. Yes, so the iPhone was the driving factor here. Over $51 billion in sales for that core product, that key product for the company. Um, and that is also coming off the back of uh, muted sales for the Mac products, um, the desktop products, that as people are probably uh, buying less of them uh, as there are fewer, as fewer lockdowns around the world have meant that this year we have seen a significant drop in PC sales, not just from Apple, but from other companies as well. And this has also boosted their earnings. Um, uh, iPhones have also boosted their earnings, uh, have also boosted their earnings, but this is also about managing expectations, that essentially we were expecting around about a 5% sales drop overall at the company. And by managing expectations and saying that and warning for that going forward, that essentially the 2.5% sales drop that the company saw is actually not much um, but as to what investors were actually expecting. So India, Aggie, took center stage on the earnings calls we heard earlier. What does this mean for Apple going forward? Yes, so as Tim Cook put it, um, that India is essentially at, at a tipping point, that they have a huge and burgeoning middle class. And it isn't just India, it is also other emerging markets. He also cited Mexico, Indonesia, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, all as, company, as, all as countries that had really boosted the revenues for Apple going into this quarter. And a big part of that is that these are countries with people who are not only uh, part of the original developing class for iPhones, but are also uh, buying those products as well. And that's key to India. India, of course, is a big focus for Apple as they try and decouple the parts of their supply chain from China as a production hub. But he was, um, uh, he was pointing out that he had visited retail stores in India as well, and that he sees India as a key consumer market of the products, not just a producer. 
Thank you so much, our Aggie Cantrell, there, our tech reporter in Berlin. Coming up, ready for takeoff, Air France KLM and British Airways owner IAG prepare for a busy summer season. So we dig into the numbers next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we've had some strong numbers out of the aviation sector this morning. British Airway owner IAG reported a surprise operating profit in the first quarter, while Air France KLM's net loss narrowed more than expected. Now, that's as bookings for the summer came rushing in. Well, joining us now is Sid Philip, our aviation reporter. Sid, you always make us smarter, and actually anything that we ask you, you know the answer to. I mean, th this is different, right? It feels better if you're IAG than if you're Air France. Exactly. So I think IAG surprised the market with the sort of positive expectation about the profit uh, sort of turnaround and sort of surprise profit that they posted. And I think that's a lot of that's driven by both leisure demand yep. as well as the fact that there is sort of people are sort of getting out and traveling again. Air France KLM slightly more muted. They aren't being as sort of they aren't really talking about what their outlook is for the year. And so I think that's the sort of the dichotomy that they have in the industry. And I think IAG especially, I mean, IAG's got a sort of fleet of diverse airlines. They've got Aer Lingus, they own Iberia, they own British Airways. And each of them have a slightly different dynamic. Yeah. But like, so Iberia is doing really well on business travel, as well as leisure travel to Latin America. We've seen British Airways do well on transatlantic travel, and that's mainly driven by leisure. And they've been saying that business travel hasn't come back. So I think there is sort of very different results within those results. And I think at the moment, everyone's sort of looking forward to summer, and summer is really being driven by leisure travel. Mm -hmm. And essentially, people are willing to travel even as sort of capacity remains constrained. But so, so what, I, what I'm you know, trying to figure out, and you're the expert, so I'm, you'll be able to tell me better, is that every day I have someone saying, like, look, I want to travel here, there, and it costs like 800 euros just to get to Milan. I mean, prices for tickets are so expensive. Is this, again, because of revenge traveling, or did we lose routes, or is this just another leg in aviation? So it's a, it's a big mix of both. So one, there is like insane demand at the moment, and that's driving up prices. On the other hand, <clears throat> you also have airlines that are sort of haven't sort of, they've had trench, retrench in certain routes, and so capacity is limited. And while carriers are bringing back capacity, none of them are yet back to 100%, especially for the legacy carriers yeah. like British Airways and others. So I think because constrained capacity combined with the fact that demand is so out of the market at the moment, that's really driving up prices. And for the airline industry, which has had sort of a battering during COVID, this is really good news because oil prices have come down. And so essentially they can make more money at the moment at a time after sort of making so, such big losses for the last two years. All right. Thank you so much, Sid. I did tell you, Sid always has the answer. Sid Phillips there with the very latest on the aviation industry. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Alex Morgan. Hi, Alex. Hi, Francine. Good morning. German factory orders have seen their largest slump since the pandemic as manufacturing continued to fare worse than other parts of Europe's largest economy. Demand has declined 10.7% in March. That's much faster than was expected. Services in Germany have been doing better recently amid robust demand from consumers. The ECB has delivered its smallest interest rate increase yet in its inflation fight, but insisted the move won't be the last. Downshifting to a 25 basis point hike, the central bank's president, Christine Lagarde, says it's clear the ECB is not pausing and future decisions will remain data dependent. The new deposit rate of 3.25% is the highest since 2008. And Ed Sheeran has won a closely watched trial over claims he copied key musical elements from a 1970s song by Marvin Gaye. A federal jury in Manhattan delivered the verdict. That's the second time the pop star has successfully defeated copyright claims. Last year, a court in the UK found he didn't copy from another song to create his hit, Shape of You. And the number of people smoking cigarettes in the US has sunk to its smallest level since 1965. Latest data shows just 11.5% of Americans smoked cigarettes last year, as beating a target set by the US government. However, about one in five adults reported using a tobacco product with e-cigarette use rising to 4.5%. That's global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Alex Morgan, and this is Bloomberg.
Alex, thanks so much. Now, PacWest is leading some of the regional bank stocks in the U.S. up. If we have a look at the board look, we did see a you know pretty bruising route, and now PacWest shares gaining as much as 12 percent. Look, Peers, Western Alliance Bank, First Horizon also gaining. They're joining a broader rally across U.S. stock futures ahead of the jobs data to you later today, and then we're going on to the weekend, so we'll see exactly what happens there. We'll have plenty more on the U.S. regional banking sector. Again, shares up. We dive deeper into that story. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. West, First Horizon and Western Alliance shares pair some of yesterday's sharp declines, but concerns continue to swirl around the sector's visibility. European stocks, U.S. futures point higher as traders prepare to scrutinize today's U.S. payrolls report for signs that the labor market pressures continue to ease. Plus, Germany factory orders fall the most since the pandemic as manufacturing continues to drag more than other parts of Europe's largest economy. So good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So we were just talking about some of the regional banks. So let's have a look at what they're doing pre-market. The focus after the sell-off that we had yesterday is actually gains across the board for some of these regional banks. Look, be careful or at least take it with a pinch of stall. So first of all, there's a lot of rumors swirling around about uh, possible takeovers or possible sales. If you look at PacWest, it's definitely leading a rebound across U.S. regional banking stocks after the losses. But there are also escalating worries over the health of the industry, partly why we're seeing also maybe this gain pre-market is because we're waiting for U.S. jobs data. So let's bring in Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Valerie, what exactly, good morning, is a circuit breaker for the banking crisis? Well, Francine, if you would ask the market this question yesterday, they would have replied, we need Fed cuts. At the worst of the session yesterday, the market had gone and priced a full 25 basis point cut from the Fed as soon as July. Now, there's others out there that claim the FDIC needs to uh, propose a blanket uh, insurance to deposits out there in order to stem this crisis. But I would argue we're at a different stage. Those banks we discussed just just now, uh, Western Alliance, uh, PAC West, they do not suffer from an uninsured deposit issue. 75% of both of those banks' uh, deposit base is insured. The problem now is morphing more into one of profitability. One of, uh, are these banks viable when a cost of funding at a five and a quarter Fed funds and a yield curve this inverted? That ultimately isn't fixed until the Fed starts to cut rates. So, Valerie, what do we know about this FDIC proposal? So we've heard from Bloomberg reports that the FDIC is planning to announce their special assessment as soon as next week. This is to recoup the $23 billion worth of losses from the first round of bank failures in March. Now, it's been reported that they want to put most of the burden of this fee on the larger lenders out there and exempt some of the smaller ones, up to $10 billion in assets, but possibly $50 billion in assets if they have a smaller deposit base. Now, this is nothing on Unusual. It's what the FDIC did back in 2009 when they needed to recoup their losses after the 2008 bank failures. Their special assessment did hit the bigger banks first, especially JP Morgan. They were saddled with a $675 million fee in the second quarter of 2009 that hit their earnings per share by 10 cents. All right, thank you so much. Our Valerie Titel there with the very latest on the banks. Now, we're getting, of course, data. The big data point that we're looking at is in the U.S. That's jobs, but we are getting a little bit of construction PMI for the month of April here in the U.K. Again, a little bit backward looking, rising to 51.1, a touch better than forecast. And, of course, that's a tale of two countries when you compare it to the factory orders out of Germany that were a big disappointment. Now, my next guest is chief executive of international property development company, Donati. 
Agency Immobiliare. They represent almost 2,000 young construction industry entrepreneurs as president of Ance Giovanni. Angelica Donati, welcome to the program. It's always a Hi, great Francine. to catch up. So a lot of what you do, of course, is based in Italy. We usually catch up uh, when there's a political crisis. So it's also refreshing <laughs> to have you here when there's no political crisis for the moment. Are supply chains getting easier? What's the construction um, you know, industry looking like? So the construction industry had uh, a big boom back in 2021 and in 2022 post-COVID. So we were in Italy, but also across Europe, the, the driving force um, in the recovery. Um, just to give you a few numbers, in 2021, 33% of GDP growth, so a third of GDP growth, which was the highest in Europe, almost 7%, came from construction. In 2022, it was 22%. So it was, it was a strong boost for a sector that's only about 10 to 15% of national GDP. So construction has been growing, um, but it suffered, it, it suffered and is suffering um, uh, from very strong supply yeah. chain constraints yeah. because obviously and inflation. and inflation so inflation uh, is at historical highs I think the last time it was this high I wasn't even born so uh, it's, it's been a while and um, and and also there were massive supply chain issues especially around items such as quartz and steels because of the war in Ukraine all the big quartz and plants are in and in Ukraine now that has subsided so yeah. production has been able to kind of go back to somewhat yeah. a normal rate but still the prices have not gone so, down Andrea, are you expecting I mean if this is normalizing and this you know is a question of trends when it normalizes will the trend continue to normalize when are we expecting I guess an easier environment for a lot of the construction companies based in Italy that's a million dollar question so the the, the fact is that with the recovery fund monies being spent, which are almost 200 billion euros in Italy, of which about 50% will be spent through construction projects, we have a very tight time frame to do so. So it's 2026, the infrastructure and other projects that are being built need to be completed and operational. So even though the kind of COVID-driven supply chain constraints and inflation yeah. might start to subside and are starting to mm -hmm. subside, I can't imagine that prices are going to go down anytime soon no. because now, in the tail end of this year and next year, you'll have all the big projects coming into play. And so there will be a price pressure regardless. I mean, is it easier or is it more difficult to find workers in the construction space? I mean, this is also one of the shortages that you know, we talk a yeah. lot about here in the UK, but also elsewhere, elsewhere, including Italy. It's a global problem. So there, um, there's numbers that predate COVID, which show that there is a massive lack of new new talent, new workers coming into play. The average age of construction workers is over 50. I think it's around 55 globally. So the problem was here before everything that happened in the, in the past few years. But um, now that you're, you're kind of trying to restart yeah. something that has been dormant for a long time because construction yeah. was a laggard for many, many years before this new boom, the, the workforce pressure is very strong. So we calculated as a construction industry association that just to build what is now in the pipeline, so mm -hmm. not thinking about future projects, there's 60,000 people missing in Italy alone. That's a lot, Angelica. Yeah. Like and, and with the China reopening, does it also mean that it's going to be more difficult to have access to materials or you have access but the price just goes up? You have access but the price just goes up. I, uh, up to last year, there was a massive constraint in supply. Yeah. Now it's more of a price-driven element, but lead times are longer. So yeah. you have to plan that as well. And one of the big problems with, the, with all these recovery fund uh, funded yeah. a project coming into play is that the timing is tight and we don't know whether no. the supply chain will be able to keep up almost keep up. right exactly Angelica, I mean, we also had a bit of a wobble I think about two weeks ago that there, there were questions about the disbursements of this plans because of a vote in Parliament I mean, this is like it, you know Italian politics at its best and there was a bit of a freak out from uh, markets and investors but then that was arranged do you worry about some of the disbursements of these EU funds that are a real game changer for Italy and for the construction industry not going as smoothly as, as, as it could be? I think the plan is ambitious. It was ambitious on day one. And then there's been, there have been issues which are not Italian. They're European, they're global issues, the, you know, the inflationary yeah. 
push that we just discussed, which also made it harder to deploy funds and to assign contracts because yeah. all of the, the, the contracts needed to be repriced with the new increased prices. So there is objective issues that are not related to Italy or Italy's management of the situation, but just global factors. So I think what is going to probably have to happen is that some of these more uh, far-fetched, not far-fetched, but the, the, the more difficult, difficult projects, the ones that are, aren't already underway, might need to be refunded under other schemes yeah. just to make sure that we don't wait money nobody wants to do that okay thank you so much for all of the insight angelica and joining us actually here in the london studio anche giovanni president angelica donate joining us on construction eu funds and of course the wider inflation concerns coming up the uk gears up for the first coronation of monarch in 70 years we discuss what to expect next and this is bloomberg The waterfront area in Belfast already plays host to some big international companies like Citigroup and the law firm Baker McKenzie. Joe Biden says there's billions of dollars more of American investment ready to come here if power sharing government is restored. But do those hopes seem realistic? And what would they mean for the future of Northern Ireland's economy? Now, Northern Ireland has enjoyed uh, significant American investment over the last 25 years since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. I think what we're recognizing is an opportunity to accelerate uh, and rapidly increase that, that interest. The experience for American investors today is the date has been hugely positive. They've all made substantial reinvestments and commitments to the Belfast and Northern Ireland marketplace. But not everyone shares the optimism from business leaders, particularly those young people who've grown up here since the Good Friday Peace Agreement. I think that the optimism is refreshing after a long period of pessimism, but I'm not really sure if it matches the reality of people's prospects in Northern Ireland today. We still are struggling with a lack of investment into Northern Ireland and a lack of business opportunities, particularly for young people. I think it's very different looking at it from an outsider's perspective. When you live here, it seems very different because you are seeing day in, day out, the actual impact of things on the ground in the health service and just how bad it is. While those people have high hopes, it's very different if a family member is in hospital and you're seeing the impact of having no government and why on earth would anybody want to stay? The missing piece in the quest for more prosperity in Northern Ireland is the lack of a functioning government. There hasn't been one here at Stormont since February of 2022. And for now, at least, there's no sign of that changing. Well, Bloomberg Radio, Stephen Carroll reporting with that look at the state of Northern Ireland's economy. Now, today it does mark the one year since the last assembly elections. Still no government in place. Business leaders in the region are optimistic about promises of new investment from the U.S. President Joe Biden and from Westminster. But not everyone in Northern Ireland feels the same. Well, our star reporter Stephen Carroll joins us now with the very latest. So, Stephen, great package. You learn a lot, and actually, it's you know incredible where this could end up with. Any news on this power? This possible power sharing agreement? No, and I mean that's part of the issue is that we're looking at yet again a very long period without a power sharing government in Northern Ireland. The Democratic Unionist Party say they won't join that government because of their unhappy with the post-Brexit EU trade rules, despite the Windsor framework, which Rishi Sunak has heralded as this unique and privileged position for Northern Ireland because. Northern Irish businesses have access both to the UK and the EU markets as well. The other issue, though, that's weighing particularly, and we heard it there from Emer Smith in that report, is public services in Northern Ireland. Because there's no functioning government, the Northern Ireland Secretary has had to set the budget for Northern Ireland. That means they're facing £800 million of cuts in spending this year. The health service already has the longest waiting lists in the UK. Uh, it's facing a shortfall of £470 million in its budget this year. Those are the sort of issues that are going to wear on voters' minds. Local elections we're talking about them happening in the England yesterday. They're due in Northern Ireland in two weeks' time. Yeah, so how are businesses just dealing with the lack of government? Well, for part of this report, we spoke to the head of Belfast, a city group, Belfast office, Lee Mayer, the city group, one of the biggest private sector employers yeah. in Northern Ireland. He says basically they've had to get used to the fact that there hasn't been a functioning government because this has happened so regularly over the past 25 years for such long periods of time. And essentially, he says they've found ways to be able to press on regardless. They would like to have a government in place. And that's something that we heard from Joe O'Neill from Belfast Harbour as well. Belfast Harbour is interesting because they're the biggest or one of the biggest commercial property landlords in Northern 
Northern Ireland, so they have a good sense of where other businesses are going as well. They say they've seen interest from US investors, but it's much harder to sell that foreign direct investment proposition if you don't have the same easy access to government ministers in the way that you know you would here in London or indeed in Dublin as well, another competing region for investment too. Yeah, so true. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Stephen Carroll, they're of course on the very latest for this power sharing agreement. Now London uh, gearing up to crown King Charles III tomorrow in the UK's first coronation ceremony in 70 years. Well, Lizzie Burden joins us uh, now with the very latest. So Lizzie, what can we expect? And you also crunch the numbers. Yes, Francine, I hope you've got your champagne in the fridge because it's going to be a big bank holiday weekend here in the UK to celebrate the coronation. We're expecting a big procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. The king is going to be travelling in a six-horse drawn carriage. A gold crown will be placed atop his head at the coronation ceremony. But for all the pomp -a -pom and pageantry, I have to say it is a slimmed-down version of the coronation last held in 1953, of course, for the king's late mother, Queen Queen Elizabeth II. It'll be about half the guests, uh, half the time, a quarter of the guests. And you might interpret this as uh, a symbol of Britain's diminished place in the world. The US President Joe Biden isn't attending. He has tried to emphasize that it's not a snub at the UK. The other way you might interpret it is that this is the monarchy being sensitive to the cost of living crisis. Of course, we've still got double digit inflation here. Or a third interpretation might be this is King Charles setting out how he intends to reign with a slimmed down monarchy, fewer senior working royals, a monarchy for the modern era, you might say. And meanwhile, Lizzie, Rishi Sunak and his Tories also suffered big losses in early UK elections and local elections. How does that change the way forward for them? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the votes have finished and the numbers are being counted. It does look like a bruising defeat on the way for Rishi Sunak. Of the 1,600 uh, seats already counted, uh, you've already seen Labour winning more than 200 uh, in the first set of results, including significant victories in Medway, Stoke-on-Trent. So the symbolism here is this is the first real electoral test for Rishi Sunak before the general election next year. And when we were looking at the 1997 landslide victory for Tony Blair, there were lots of significant local wins for Labour before that. On the flip side, local elections do tend to be dominated by local issues, bins and potholes. The Liberal Democrats also tend to outperform. But I would just point you to the wisdom of John Curtis, the polling expert. He says if Labour can secure a double-digit victory lead and the vote share, that suggests they're going to get a parliamentary majority at the general election next year. So that, Francine, is the prize to be won. Thank you so much, our UK correspondent there, Lizzie Burden. Now, this week on our UK show, we spoke to the chief executive of the Crown Estate, the biggest of investment entities for the royal family, which manages more than £16 billion worth of assets. You can catch the episode on our website and social media channels. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash with Alex Morgan. Hi, Alex. Hi, Frank. Good morning. BMW is the latest car maker to extend its recall of vehicles with Takata airbags. It's telling owners of the 90,000 uh, sedans and SUVs not to drive them until the defective equipment has been fixed. That recall covers older vehicles. In the US alone, Takata airbags have been blamed for at least 25 deaths. Bloomberg has learned that Microsoft is working with AMD on the chipmaker's expansion into processors for artificial intelligence. The companies are teaming up to offer an alternative to NVIDIA, which dominates the market for AI-capable chips. Now, that move reflects Microsoft's deepening involvement in the industry, with chip investment totaling $2 billion so far. And a blockbuster result uh, from Macquarie's commodities trading business has helped offset a downturn in deal-making has delivered a 10% jump in annual profit for the Australian Investment Bank. Nick O'Kane, who heads up the powerhouse commodities trading business, saw his pay exceed that of the firm's CEO. 
Well, Accane's total remuneration for the year rose almost 60% to more than $38 million. There you go. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Alex Morgan, and this is Bloomberg. Francine. Alex, thank you so much. Now, German factory orders plummeted by the most since the pandemic in March. That's as manufacturing continued to fare worse than other parts of Europe's largest economy. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank hinted at further rate hikes at its policy meeting yesterday, despite potential economic headwinds. Well, joining us now is Ven Ram from our markets live team. Ven, love speaking to you, especially on a big markets day. So first of all, will the ECB be able to keep raising rates even if the Fed stops? Morning, Francine. I think that, you know, the uh, I think the short answer to your question is yes. I think they, at least they seem to be intended to be go down that path. Uh, the markets took the uh, ECB statement as very dovish yesterday, but I don't think that the statement itself was per se so dovish. Uh, the, re the reaction in the bond markets was overdone. President Lagarde was at pains to point out in the press conference that there is likely to be more than one rate increase left. They also decided to end APP reinvestments from July, which was again hawkish because most people were expecting that announcement to come next month rather than this month. So I think that on the whole, the ECB tried to kind of uh, walk back the kind of dovishness in the markets in the press conference. They succeeded only to some extent, but you see the reaction in Boons today yields are ticking higher, and I think that's the way forward for the markets. Uh, they may not go aggressive, but there are more rate increases coming. Evan, how important are today's jobs numbers for the Fed's rates calculus? I think the most important part of the jobs report is actually outside it, meaning the wider backdrop of the banking sector stress is what is going to be driving the markets now. We are expecting, economists are expecting job creation to slow, but considering that we are on a nearly three-year run, three run of uh, labor market expansion and the jobless rate being re at record lows, it would be just one more piece of data confirming strength in the labor market. So the Fed is unlikely to look at the strong set of numbers and go, hey, hang on, we need to raise rates once more. That's just not going to happen. And therefore, the, today's non-firm payrolls report isn't what it usually is the reaction will be underwhelming in the markets. Uh, talk to me about Japan and actually yen prospects, Ven. Well, I, the yen has underperformed this year, uh, defying expectations for it to rally. I do think that there, there is going to be a rally later on this year, especially with the Fed stopping, uh, moving to the sidelines. That means that real rate differentials between the yen and the dollar are going to narrow in favor of the yen, and that is going to give uh, some kind of push towards uh, yen, yen trades. And also, if you think that the BOE is going to recant on its policy stance, on its curve control, at some point later this year, uh, I think that is going to be, again, positive for the yen. Ven, as always, thanks so much. Ven Ram there from Bloomberg's Markets Live team. Now, we're also looking at Apple. We did have earnings that were a little bit better than expected. It was still a 2.5% decline compared to the previous quarter. Uh, the chief executive definitely betting big on India instead of China. And you can see pre-market Apple gaining some 2.2%. The other big story is, of course, U.S. regional banks. After the sell-off that we saw yesterday, again, pre-market, there seems to be a lot of stabilizing. Let's see what the weekend brings in terms of um, either deals or some kind of resolution. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller in New York, Anna Edwards here in London, and this is Bloomberg. I think we are going to have more stress exhibited across the markets in, in the coming months. There are pockets of tightness in financial conditions, but a broad-based one at this stage, the type that would change the Fed's response function, I don't see that in the data as we sit here today. Will inflation stick around? No, I don't think it will. I think money supply is telling us it's going to go pretty fast. The recession is coming and the bank problems haven't gone away. You're looking at a, at a potential downturn in the economy uh, relative to the strength everyone was looking for. Am I going to say it's going to be a deep or significant downturn? At this particular juncture, I can't make that call. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. 
It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Apple's iPhone bounces back. Sales were better than expected and helped the world's most valuable company to beat estimates. Big banks will pay the price for those regional bank failures. The FDIC plans to make them kick in extra to refill the deposit insurance fund. And the U.S. jobs report for April comes out today. It's likely to show that employers scale back hiring and the unemployment rate ticked up slightly. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, uh, we've got, of course, the jobs report later today. That is going to be the big focus for the markets. The market's very convinced that we see a pause and then cuts from the Fed. If the jobs data comes in anything different, they could get, uh, it comes in with a different tone, they could get a shock. That's right. That's why we're watching it so closely, right? So the jobs data all of a sudden um, takes our focus off of the regional banks for a moment, which may cause a sigh of relief for some. We do see futures rising right now here in the U.S. S&P E-minis up about a half a percent um, after a close in turmoil yesterday, really, because we had a renewed drop for those regional banks. You didn't really see broader contagion um, across the indexes, but certainly um, renewed worry about what happens um, to those regional banks. A lot of people comparing uh, what we're seeing now to 1933, which is when the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was actually formed. Um, take a look at the 10-year yield climbing just a little bit back towards 340. Uh, remember, earlier this week we were at 355, then we dropped down to 330, so now we're coming back a little bit as investors um, feel comfortable enough to let go of some of that debt. NYMEX crude still holding under $70 a barrel, so 69.62 after we dropped on Wednesday evening down to a 63 handle, we climbed steadily back up, but uh, still far off of the $80 that OPEC uh, Plus likely wants to see. Of course, that's for Brent, which is, I think, currently around $73, $74 a barrel. Bitcoin right now um, up another $188, still at 29000 and change, which is where, exactly where we saw it at this time yesterday, but sh showing some relative strength even as the tech stocks to which it's so highly correlated don't. Take a look at what's going on or, or what happened overnight in the Asian trade, the MSCI Asian Pacific uh, index, the broader index across the region up about a quarter percent, whereas the Hang Seng did well in Hong Kong, um, the CSI uh, down a half a percent on the mainland, and you do see the U.S. dollar a little bit weaker against the end, but again, trading exactly where we saw it 24 hours ago. 134 yen is what you can buy for one U.S. dollar. Anna, what do you see in Europe ahead of this big jobs report? Yeah, ahead of the jobs report, we actually see some decent gains for Europe. The German DAX up by seven tenths of one percent, the CAC Caron up by half a percent. So gains coming through across the European space. And as if to underline yet again the way that the European banking sector is not feeling that downdraft from the regional banking story in the US, uh, the banking sector is actually one of the better performing sectors here in Europe today. Let's have a look at some of the other uh, movers today that have pulled out the energy sector. Matt, you've talked about the slight rebound that we've seen in oil prices today. And that off, uh, off we started the week, of course, with much higher oil prices dropped to $73 on Brent. Uh, uh, now we're around that kind of level. Uh, but that is boosting that little rebound we have seen, uh, boosting energy stocks here in Europe. So Europe energy names up by 1.9%, the best performing sector in Europe today. Uh, and here's the banking uh, theme that I was mentioning, that sector up by 1.3%. IAG, the owner of British Airways and Iberia, the uh, international aviation group, is up by 3% today. Their numbers beat estimates. They're increasing their guidance for what they can do this year. They actually managed to turn in a profit in the first quarter, even though analysts had expected there to be a loss. And it seems even without the front of the plane filling up with business travellers, there are enough uh, leisure travellers who are willing to pay those prices. And so that's oh, how leisure. the story's going there. Adidas is uh, up by... I do that on purpose, by the way. Adidas is it. up by... 8% this morning as uh, this business clearly still has an issue with a big pile of Yeezy uh, stuff that it can't now sell. They broke off uh, their relations with the artists involved, so they can't sell that. So that's still an issue. But on the other hand, there's a lot of optimism around the new CEO who's come into the business, uh, he with experience from Puma. And so uh, a lot of focus there on what they can do in China and elsewhere, Matt. All right, we're going to continue to focus on the Adidas story. Uh, just seeing headlines across from the CEO. No final decision on the Beyonce partnership. And it's just so interesting to see how much these partnerships with pop stars have uh, played a role in the success or uh, failure of Adidas stock on any given day. Let's get, though, to a company that is way bigger. In fact, 
um, one of the biggest in the world. Apple beat earnings estimates, signaling the iPhone is weathering an industry-wide downturn better than had been expected. On the earnings call, the CEO, Tim Cook, discussed India, Apple's new financial products, and, of course, artificial intelligence. I do think it's very important to be deliberate and thoughtful in how you approach uh, these things. And there's a number of issues that need to be sorted. Joining us for more is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. So, Alex, we were looking for a downturn in terms of uh, iPhone sales, really for uh, every segment at Apple. How do they do? Yeah, it was a beat, quite a substantial one, given the expectations. Uh, the thing that actually sort of stands out, though, is if you look at what they were guiding, which was for a decline similar to what had happened in the uh, previous quarter, that was about 5.5%. Then, of course, you saw analysts revise expectations in line with that. The actual decline was 2.5%. So, you know, it's easy to say, oh, I iPhone massively outperformed. Apple had done quite a good job of setting expectations. Nonetheless, iPhone sales did increase. And that's, as you say, at a, at a time when generally smartphone sales aren't doing brilliantly. Uh, good morning to you, Alex. And uh, we did hear a lot about India. They, they talked about that on the call, as we've mentioned. Why is Apple so keen to talk up the prospects of India? Is this as a, a source of demand for them or a source of product, manufacturing supply or both? I mean, both. Ultimately, they need to show their diversifying supply away from China, given some of the problems there. It's happening very slowly, given the way they're so deeply embedded. But also, they need to show a new leg of growth to investors. The struggle is going to be, is it going to come from products? Well, we suspect there's going to be some sort of virtual reality headset coming later this year. That is going to be very, very small volumes to begin with. If it's not product, therefore, it's going to be new markets. And China was a huge leg of growth for the best part of a decade. 15 years ago, when it opened its first store in uh, China, it had less than a billion dollars in sales. It's just opened its first store in India. It has about $6 billion worth of sales. So it's at a further ahead. Nonetheless, that $6 billion is less than 2% of its total revenue. So it's coming from still, in relative terms, a low base. All right, Alex, thanks very much. Alex Webb there talking to us about Apple earnings. Um, we'll look to see if they have a real effect on markets today. Of course, we had this uh, huge... Um, non-farm payrolls number to deal with, and we have the regional banking issues. PacWest leading a rebound across U.S. regional banking stocks following a bruising week of trading halts and gigantic losses. TD Cowan analyst Jarrett Seiberg saying, quote, we believe the banks are having their GameStop-like moment where social media is amplifying non-traditional approaches to assessing solvency. I love the way he puts that. This creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that pressures stock prices, which then lead to more questions. Bloomberg's Simone Foxman joins us now for more. And uh, so well put. You know, I was thinking yesterday, if, um, you know, if, if there's a run on a bank and they have enough money to pay back depositors, does anybody hear it? And the answer right now is definitely yes. Well, if it's a GameStop moment, you know, when it was GameStop, no one really, it wasn't a big financial um, systemic risk. But now with the banks, it has the potential to be that way. And, you know, the issue here is so much different than what happened to SVB or even to First Republic. When you look at PacWest, which lost about half its value yesterday, you're looking at a bank that had 75% of its deposits insured, not that major excessive loan book that had declined in value on top of the change in interest rates. And Paul Davies at Bloomberg Opinion makes a really excellent point in a column out. He says, you know, PacWest is experience, it's experiencing some of these weaker margins brought on by higher costs for deposits, and some of that has to do with interest rates. That leads to falling shares. But when you're in this environment of so much instability, falling shares beget falling shares, and that's spooking consumers, forcing them out into this GameStop moment, and then the question becomes what's needed to kind of end some of this risk. And it, of course, so much more important when it's banking rather than, you know, video game operator. Mm, yeah, and so we go from this period of worrying about bank runs and treasury holdings in banks, Simone, to worrying about the, the, the underlying business models and just how profitable they are or are not right now. And, and then let's go to the FDIC part of this, because we also understand overnight uh, that the FDIC is planning on asking big banks to, to, to pay up, to put more money into the insurance fund. Uh, tell us the latest on what we know here. 
Yeah, well, the FDIC believes that this overall banking issue is likely to cost uh, some $18 billion. This would become as a special assessment, really targeting those lenders with more than $50 billion of assets. Those with $10 billion of assets or less likely wouldn't have to pay into the special assessment at all, and banks with up to $50 billion in assets might be able to get out of this. We understand that this plan is likely to be introduced next week, but of course all of this taking place uh, on the backdrop of potential changes to the way FDIC does its overall insurance. One of those ideas is some sort of targeted coverage with bigger uh, coverage for business accounts over that $250,000 uh, limit. We could see the U.S. potentially move to back all deposits, at least on a temporary basis, or no change at all. Those are things that are being considered as well. The targeted coverage approach which might take Congress to come in. That's something that's likely to play out, not necessarily immediately, but over the coming weeks and months. Well, of course, as for now, they do back all deposits on well, a temporary basis yeah, without okay. congressional uh, uh, help. Simone, thanks so much, Simone Foxman there, covering uh, that issue for us. Now, let's turn our attention back to the jobs report. Non-farm payrolls comes out at 8.30 a.m., of course, on Wall Street. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us for a preview. So, Valerie, what are the numbers that we're looking for today? The number today is 185K, Matt. If we come above consensus today, that takes it to a 13-month streak that payrolls have become above consensus. Just astounding when you think about it. Many people calling for this labor market to turn quickly and to turn soon, but it just hadn't. If you take all of these numbers into consideration, it is not reflective of even a labor market heading towards neutral. Powell just two days ago described the labor market still as extraordinarily tight. We will not see any moderation in average hourly earnings on a month-on-month -month or a year-on-year -year basis either if we hit these numbers on consensus. Just when will this labor market start to reflect some weakness is the question on everyone's minds. Okay, Valerie, and that's a focus, of course, that, uh, when it comes to the jobs report. How markets are positioned for this report is really going to be interesting. The market, as we said earlier, so convinced that the Fed now pauses for a period, maybe not all that long, and then cuts. If we get a hot print today in terms of that labour market story, that could really shock that narrative. Look, Anna, I think it's going to take more than just one hot print in order to get the market to start pricing a five and a half Fed funds, maybe another hike in June. Maybe we, a hot labor market print uh, added to that, maybe a hot CPI print next week. Maybe that'll jolt the markets. Right now, we are pricing in aggressive Fed cuts out in the next tw uh, 12 months. The market is pricing 200 basis points of Fed cuts. That is a quick reversion back to neutral. But while we're on the topic of the Fed, I want to talk about their own unemployment forecast. Their year-end unemployment forecast for 2023 is 4.5%. So that implies if we get a consensus print today, we need to see an average loss of 95K jobs per month from May until the end of the year. Now that might sound crazy, but if we look at historical norms, that's quite consistent with the start of a recession with the restart of a session in July. Now, the Fed, we get their, un, uh, their updated uh, summary of economic projections at their next meeting. A really strong labor market, a continuing strong labor market will really start to push these numbers into question. All right, Valerie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel there previewing the non-farm payrolls number for us. Let's take a look at some of the stocks that are moving in the pre-market this morning. First of all, Carvana uh, surging 36% after the debt-ridden automobile retailer said it expects to report a positive operating profit in this current quarter. EBITDA, which was negative $24 million in the first quarter, which is the reporting quarter, is expected to rise above the zero line in uh, Q2. And the Q1 figures that they reported were also better than analyst estimates. So massive jump in a stock that I think a lot of people have been betting against. Also, DraftKings, which is, of course, the online sports book, posted first quarter sales that beat analyst estimates and raised its guidance for the full year. That sent the stock higher by more than 11 percent in the pre-market this morning. Um, Coinbase is another one that posted better than expected uh, 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 profit, I should say, really a narrower loss um, and a smaller than estimated revenue decline. 
as the biggest U.S. digital asset trading platform saw first quarter results stabilize. It's up 10 percent in the pre-market as well. More and more people, uh, I guess, coming back to crypto as we see Bitcoin um, going back to 30,000. And then Lyft, it forecasts revenue in the current quarter that was lower than the street was looking for, showing, highlighting the challenges that the new CEO, incoming CEO, David Risher faces to turn around the struggling number two by a lot ride-sharing company. Of course, Uber completely dominates in this space. Uh, Lyft, as a result, down more than 16% in the pre-market. Anna? Coming up on the program then, Matt, we'll get back to the markets shortly. We'll get into a conversation with Gordon Shannon, Portfolio Manager at 24 Asset Management. We'll talk regional banks in the U.S., get you ready for payrolls, and no pause at the ECB. We'll throw that into the mix as well. This is Big Bang. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance, the incredibly early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Anna Edwards out in London. Now, um, we are looking forward to a debt ceiling debate that could really move prices in Treasury, specifically T-bills that are maturing around what's being called the X date. We heard Janet Yellen say um, that could be as early as the beginning of June. As a result, if you look at this sort of spaghetti salad of, char of, of, of a chart, you can see uh, different maturities. So um, June 1st, July 27th, June 20th, June 6th, May 25th. Um, and the question is, does this tell us when the X date is? So you can see that investors have uh, sold off one in particular, the yield rising to 5.408. That's uh, the T-bill maturing June 6th. So maybe that's when it's coming. Joining us to talk more about this is Bloomberg Markets Live editor Noor Al-Ali. So Noor, what do we think about this debt ceiling debate? I mean, it's really been pushed back by the Fed decision and regional banks and all the other worries that we have before then. But eventually it's going to uh, it's going to be a problem that we need to deal with. Right. Absolutely. And you can see that actually in the latest leg of the yield curve inversions, particularly the three bills against the three month T bills, apologies, against the 10 year, you'll see that that's actually been driven by investor anxiety or concern over what, you know, Powell described as uncharted territory. Uh, those fears about, you know, the U.S. defaulting is something that we've not really seen before. And it will have an incredible impact on pretty much everything and wide ramifications from the economy to financial assets. And that chart that you mentioned here really does show you that tension within the Treasury market itself. You are seeing, you know, the T-bills the, the that are maturing towards the end of May at 4.5 percent, but there's about a 60 to 90 basis point premium towards the, the June and the July ones, and that's just reflecting those tensions. It was interesting to hear Jerome Powell say that this is not something that the Fed can protect the U.S. economy from the after effects of if we were to see some sort of default on the debt, which was an interesting part of that press conference. He sort of volunteered those words, didn't he? Um, let me go to the oil story and commodities, because this has been a big part of the story this week, uh, Noor. It seems that this asset class, almost more than any other, has really latched onto the idea of recession coming in the U.S. and started to price that in, rightly or wrongly. And so we see a big drop down in, uh, in Brent prices and WTI now bouncing a little, but, you know, not not getting us back to where we started the week. What's sustainable here, do you think? Well, look, for oil in particular, and we're going to talk about the global benchmark here, Brent, you'll see that the $70 level is, is pretty much a support level that's been consistently, you know, where prices have consistently stayed above. You've seen OPEC as well try to intervene or at least support the market above those prices. Now, of course, the caveat here is that OPEC says we don't support the market for prices. What we really look at is, this, you know, to support the overall market because the fundamentals are strong. So, you know, has oil really priced in? those recession fears I'm gonna say for now yes we have held above 70 if we break below that on a technical level that's obviously gonna be a cause for concern mm. you do see that OPEC is planning for an in-person meeting in June in Vienna that's adding to investor sentiment that perhaps you know OPEC is preparing to you know to do whatever it takes to support markets if it falls below that level so it just stands to be seen okay so on a more definite recession view it could go lower then no thank you very much Nora and Ali of Bloomberg markets live joining us there remember more market analysis 
analysis available, available to you on the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Blink. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Apple's iPhone bounces back. Sales were better than expected and helped the world's most valuable company to beat estimates. Big banks will pay the price for those regional bank failures. The FDIC plans to make them kick in extra to refill the deposit insurance fund. And the US jobs report for April comes out today. It's likely to show that employers scale back hiring and the unemployment rate ticked up slightly. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. We're all focused on the jobs report to see if there are those cracks in the jobs market, although the ADP was pretty strong yesterday, Matt. Away from that, though, it seems we've got tech earnings to, to, to soothe us a little if we're a little concerned around the regional banking sector in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, there's a whole slew of tech companies out with earnings, but I don't think we can ignore the regional banking issues because, you know, um, even when we were focused on the Fed decision, right, a few hours later, you saw those regional banks start to slide again. So it seems like um, they, they, they start to fall in the, in the afternoon, Wall Street time. So let's still um, keep watching what happens with PacWest uh, and Western Alliance, etc. First off, the broader index futures are gaining right now. E-mini's up by about a half a percent um, ahead of this jobs report that is all important to Fed policy, really, and uh, the U.S. economy going forward. I think it was really interesting that Valerie Titel pointed out in order to get to where the Fed thinks unemployment is going to hit at the end of the year, we need to lose 95,000 jobs a month. And it doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. The 10-year yield right now rising a couple of basis points back towards 340, so investors feel comfortable enough to let go of that debt. NYMEX crude doing a whole lot of nothing right now at 69.46 exactly where we saw it yesterday. And the same is true with Bitcoin. $29,105. If you rewind the tape 24 hours, you will see the same price there. Let's take a look now at the regional banks that got hit so hard almost every day this week. Um, they do tend to rebound in the morning, but not this much. PacWest is up by 11%. Now, it has lost more than 80%, I think 88% of its value year to date. So this doesn't do a whole lot for investors that have been in any longer than a few hours. But nonetheless, rising 11%. Western Alliance also rising 11% in the pre-market. And Zion's Bank Corp up 3.4%. So some of these regional banks are starting to bounce back a little bit. And then we had a ton of earnings. Carvana, let me just go through them very quickly. Carvana is one that said it's going to post a profit this quarter. Um, it's been posting a ton of losses and is ridden with debt. As a result, it's up 35% in the pre-market. DraftKings also beat expectations, analyst estimates um, for profit and sales. As a result, DraftKings is up 12% in the pre-market. Coinbase uh, did better than anticipated. It was it posted a, a loss that was narrow that, narrower than expected and a sales decline that wasn't as bad as expected. Coinbase is up 10%. And then Lyft missed estimates. And it's already number two by a heck of a long way to Uber. Um, so the incoming CEO has a lot to deal with. Lyft is down 17% in the pre-market. Anna? Here in Europe then, Matt, we see ahead of that jobs report a gain of two-tenths of a percent on European stocks. So maybe moderating the gains of earlier. The energy sector is one that is making moves higher. The banking sector has also been pretty strong this morning. And in fact, it was some of the more defensive sectors that were underperforming. So underlying, uh, under, underscoring, if you like, that we're quite risk on here in Europe, despite the travails of the regional banking sector. And interesting to see them pre-market actually bouncing a bit. This is the energy sector then, also pretty strong this morning, up by 1.6%. That slight rebound in the oil price after what's been a pretty tough week for the oil price. Uh, that certainly is in focus for energy stocks, and so energy stocks going a little higher this morning. IAG, the owner of British Airways and Iberia, the aviation group up by 2.6%, better than expected numbers, guiding a little higher. Uh, we certainly see uh, people are engaging in that revenge tourism still post-pandemic. That's a theme. Adidas is up by 7.9%. They've still got a lot of inventory to shift. Yeezy branded inventory that they still haven't decided how that's all going to uh, get worked through. But there is a lot of optimism surrounding the strategy, the strategic plan from 24 onwards being put in place by the new CEO. And so that stock up pretty strongly this morning, Matt.
All right, so we'll watch all of that, but focus really on right now, um, just three hours from now, we're going to get the non-farm payrolls number. So let's get Gordon Shannon in to uh, get his take on it. He's portfolio manager at 24 Asset Management. Gordon, there's so much to talk about, right? We've got the debt ceiling out a little bit longer term. We've got the regional banks that continue to flare up on a daily basis. But front and center is non-farm payrolls. At 8.30 Wall Street time, we get that number. What do you expect? I think that number is going to come in below 150. And of course, perversely, that's going to cause a, a rally in risk assets as it um, further feeds into the, the, the idea that um, Powell's um, data driven and that therefore he's going to pivot soon. But I think we, we do well to pay attention to average hourly earnings. Um, unless we see a fall in those, I'm going to remain very concerned about inflation and the participation rate as well. I'd like to see that tick up. OK, so a, a below 150, I mean, that's not where the forecast is. Mm. The forecast is for something above that, 180 yeah. or so, um, Gordon. So that would be interesting. I mean, why are you so convinced? I mean, the ADP yesterday was pretty strong. Why do yeah. you think we'll get something that, that shows more cracks on the Labour side? Well, that's it. I think we're, we're just now beginning to see the cracks. Monetary policy has a long time lag, um, but we've, you know, we've, we've seen issue after issue, and I think we're at the beginning of something fairly nasty now. OK, and where will that... So, so you say that will cause a, a rally in risk assets, but we should be mindful of what the wages mm. line and the participation sign, uh, side of things uh, also say. How do we square that with... Or well, how do we think about the regional banking story and, and how that plays into this yeah. narrative? Because, of course, some people are saying the only thing that puts a firebreak around the regional bank story is actually a pivot to cutting from the Fed. Mm. That could still be months off. So how yeah. do you view the banks? Yeah, I mean, I think they are a really serious issue here. Those banks... Um, do 50% of the lending, the, the commercial lending in the US, they own 80% of the commercial mortgages. So, you know, while each of the crises that we've seen so far has been relatively localised, I think these have the, the, the potential to be systemic. Um, and when we look at European banks, while those, you know, look sound and the regulation behind them is far stronger, I think the analogy here is the way that ABS behaved in Europe and the US through the financial crisis. So in the US, we had defaults, you know, up and down structures, whereas in Europe, if these things were held to maturity, crucially held to maturity, single basis point losses in terms of defaults, but along the way, very severe price dislocations. So there's still potential for severe contagion there. So I, I, does that mean it's too early to go in and try and maybe catch falling knives to some extent? You know, when I talk to Herman Chan, who's our regional banks analyst here, he says... Um, PacWest and Western Alliance, these banks have enough money, even if everyone decided to empty his or her bank account, they would be able to give those depositors their funds. So it's really just a crisis of confidence, in which case you may want to buy these assets while they're cheap. I think the trouble is that it's going to be the larger banks that get to buy them when they're cheap. I, I don't think um, equity holders are going to be the ones that, that went out here. And you know, while there might be the money to cover depositors, what you've got to look at is the quality of the assets, the number of assets that are there under held to maturity and thus aren't being marked to market. Um, I really you know, worry about the commercial real estate holdings and you know, these are, are buildings that just can't be refinanced at current rates. All right, so uh, w what would you do in U.S. stocks right now, Gordon? I mean, um, the banks are, are terrifying. The big tech companies have already come so far so fast this year um, and you've got a fed that seems determined to raise or hold i should say uh, rates at a relatively high level but the market doesn't really uh, buy that yeah i mean you, you you run for the hills the the for now the big tech companies the the belief continues to be that they're recession proof i mean perhaps there's a chance that that's true but yeah i i'm i'm quite worried about the u.s it's it's so driven by the consumer and when we look there at the fundamentals, um, savings have fallen from two trillion to eight hundred billion over the last two years, and that eight hundred billion will be held by more high net worth individuals with less propensity to consume. So there's very little left in the tank for U.S. consumers. I think something that also hasn't had a lot of press is um, student loan repayments. Biden put these on pause at the beginning of the pandemic, and he's continued to extend that policy. I think with the backdrop of the debt ceiling, it'll be hard to, to re-extend it, and that's coming up soon. 
and that will be a further uh, squeeze on disposable income for consumers. OK, so you see more strain for the US consumer. I mean, big tech, though, if it's US-based, is, is a much broader story than yeah. the US consumer, as we know. Yeah. So are there areas of tech, Gordon, that you would like to own, that you don't see as too expensive, that are maybe are positioned in areas that are seeing structural growth away from the cyclical nervousness? Not particularly. <laughs> the answer can be no. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say no. <laughs> so not on tech, but where, where else then? Any other areas to, to focus on? I mean, you've, you've, for me, fixed income, focus on, on high-quality bonds, investment-grade bonds. So from that point of view, you know, Apple bonds are highly rated. You know, they will get through this. You, you need to look for things that will be robust through recessions and things that lack complexity. It's all very well for your research team to have got themselves comfortable with a position, but if you're going to survive choppier, more volatile markets, you need the rest of the market to be able to get reasonably um, comfortable so that there are marginal buyers if there are forced sellers and so that there's availability of capital because it's always um, lack of liquidity rather than solvency that causes defaults. OK, Gordon, thank you very much. Gordon Shannon of 24 Asset Management, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will pick up on that tech theme shortly. Coming up, iPhone sales bounce back. We'll dive into Apple's earnings report and where the company sees growth ahead and the size and scope of that buyback. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with the Expedia CEO, Peter Kern. That's at 1.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. India is an incredibly exciting market. Uh, it's a major focus for us. Uh, I was just there, and the dynamism in the market, the vibrancy is, is unbelievable. There are a lot of people coming into the middle class, and I, I really feel that India is at a tipping point. That was uh, the Apple CEO, Tim Cook, singling out India on the earnings call. Indo India was mentioned roughly 20 times on that call, I understand. Joining us now uh, from Bloomberg Intelligence, Matt Bloxham, who uh, focuses in on the tech sector, of course. Matt, very good to have you with us. So attention really sh seems to be shifting east, just as the potential in uh, recovery in China is in focus, but growth in India also in focus. I mean, how big could that market be for Apple? Alex was telling us, Alex Webb, our colleague, telling us earlier, is growing very fast, but from a low base. It is, yeah. I mean, they don't think that they don't split it out, but we think it's about six billion dollars of revenue, so only about two percent of Apple's total sales. Uh, BI Bloomberg Intelligence analysis suggests it could grow fivefold over the next decade to around thirty billion. So quite a significant growth. And I guess you will see with the question marks about China recovery and the role of kind of U.S. businesses in China, is there's less there's less certainty about whether China is going to continue to be a growth engine uh, for Apple. So yeah, becoming a bigger player in India, I think, is really important to make people feel comfortable that there's still a, a growth ramp for them uh, with the iPhone in particular. Well. Speaking of the iPhone, it's you know a common question every quarter, Matt. Is it all about the iPhone for Apple? I know um, they've tried to break out with other products, with the watch and uh, with the iPad. You know, but Mac sales, I just can never believe they don't gain a lot of market share with these computers. How how are Mac sales doing, especially during the PC decline? Yeah, I mean, Mac sales not, not doing great. I think it's kind of reflecting that broader malaise in the, in the PC market. It's about 10% of sales, and they were down over 30% year on year in the quarter. So, real big drag on growth. Uh, I think what's going to be interesting, looking forward to the Worldwide Developer Conference on June 5th, where we might see some new product launches, a new bigger uh, MacBook Air. Uh, so, I think product refresh might help them to kind of recover some growth there. But, you know, ultimately, that the iPhone is over 50% of the sales. It's central to that. Apple ecosystem uh, and I think that's still going to be the way that they bring people in to, to, to buy other products uh, but you, you need if they're going to build share in the PC market given the products are expensive they really need to have some great features to pull people more away from the kind of the traditional PC market.
OK, so that's where they are on those products that are out there already. In terms of the AI conversation, yeah. it's one we've picked up on a number of times on other earnings mm -hmm. calls. But yeah. this time, it didn't feature that much. What's going on? No, well, you said 20 times India was mentioned. Apple didn't mention AI at all. It only came up in the Q&A, and only in one question. Mm. Uh, and they're obviously very cautious Easy. about it. But I think this is very typical of Apple. They do things differently. We've seen that time after time after time. They are clearly using AI in their products, and they will use it more. Um, I don't think you're ever going to see them perhaps be the kind of the first to use it. They'll make sure the, 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 the technology works really well. But when they launch it into their products, uh, people will really want to Siri use it. Siri needs so help, I'm Matt. Certain. Siri needs to get better. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's coming, and I think AI is already in there and, you know, helping Siri already, and obviously it needs to help uh, more. But uh, yeah, I think you're definitely going to see more from Apple on AI in the future, but in a very different way to what we're seeing from the likes of Google and Microsoft. <laughs> Somebody needs to help Matt. Thanks very much. <laughs> Matt Bloxham of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us there uh, with the latest tech themes post those Apple numbers. And coming up on the programme, countdown to the US jobs report. We've got more on what to expect next from this key piece of data. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now, investors are counting down to the U.S. jobs report due out at 8.30 a.m. Wall Street time. April's report is expected to show that employers added 185,000 jobs and that the unemployment rate ticked up to 3.6 percent. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, joins us now from Washington, D.C. So, uh, Michael, how key is this report for the Fed? Well, for the Fed and its June meeting, not so much because there's another payrolls report, but it could mean a lot to the markets today, Matt, because there is a feeling in the markets. You've seen the uh, WIRP function on the Bloomberg Fed Funds Futures trading a Fed rate cut by July. Uh, I'm told that's hedging because people are concerned about the banking system. And while the Fed isn't as concerned, at this point, you're looking at a number that's uh, roughly double what the Fed thinks uh, we need in terms of employment uh, per month to absorb new workers. So if we get a weak report, then that might feed into the narrative that the Fed could cut rates sooner. So you want to keep an eye on that. If we get a strong report, it's going to complicate those who think that uh, we're going to have a, uh, a very quick turnaround. Yeah, and what are we watching in the debt in the in the in the yield curve then, Mike? Right now, with the stress in the banking sector, the debt ceiling, it's uh, it's getting perhaps a little difficult to read the signals. But what do we see in the yield curve that helps us understand where the Fed goes next? Well, the hard part, Anna, is that there are different yield curves. And the three-month 10-year, which a lot of people are looking at, John Author's talking about it in his column today, is the most inverted ever. And there's a feeling that what people are saying is we're going to have a recession soon, probably because the banks are going to roll over and the Fed will have to react. But you look at the two-tenths curve, the one that everybody has followed the most in terms of a recession call, and it's going the other way. So it's kind of mixed messages at this point, and the Fed looks at those and says, well, we're going to stay where, where we plan to go. Mike, how many more U.S. banks need to collapse before the Fed actually does something about it, other than, you know, watch and comment? Well, the problem, Matt, is that the Fed can't really do anything about it except lend money, and they're doing that. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, the number of uh, discount window borrowings and bank term loan funding program borrowings went down last month. Discount window almost disappeared. That's because most of that lending, it turned out, went to First Republic. And that money moved into different categories now since they're not borrowing from the Fed. They just have to pay it back from uh, what's left of the bank. And so you see this dramatic fall off. And that may be why we're seeing a bit of a turnaround in the regional banks today, because if they were in so much trouble, they might be borrowing more. But they're not. So at this point, uh, the Fed will keep lending, but there isn't much else they can do. This is an FDIC and Congress situation. If it continues, if the shorts decide they've had enough of these banks, mm. then uh, maybe we get out from under.
OK, Mike, thanks very much, Ben Beggs. Uh, Michael McKee joining us there with the latest on uh, the banking sector and how that all feeds in, along with the jobs report, into the uh, latest thinking around the Fed. Now onto something completely different. London is gearing up to crown King Charles III tomorrow in the UK's first coronation ceremony in 70 years. Lizzie Burden joins us now. Lizzie, I hear it rained back in the 1950s and it looks as if it might rain again tomorrow. What else can we expect? Oh, Anna, let's hope that it doesn't. It's going to be a big bank holiday weekend for the coronation, not the best thing for the economy. Bloomberg Economics says that it'll knock £2 billion off, but lots of pomp and pageantry to enjoy. So you're going to have a big procession from Westminster Abbey, uh, from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. There, King Charles III will have a gold crown put upon his head. And it's a slimmed down affair, I have to say, since 1953 when Queen Elizabeth II was crowned. Uh, there'll be about a quarter of the guests, it'll take half the time. And you could interpret that in various ways. You could see it as Britain's place in the world having been diminished. Joe Biden, of course, isn't attending, although he's been at pains to emphasise that it isn't a snub to the UK. You could see it as the monarchy trying to be a bit sensitive to the cost of living crisis. Of course, we've still got double digit inflation here. Or perhaps you could interpret it as King Charles III starting his reign as he intends to continue it with a slimmed down version, fewer roles for senior royals, a monarchy for the modern age, perhaps. All right, very interesting uh, stuff. We'll continue to. Uh... I guess follow this. There's not going to be a surveillance live coverage of this event. I'm pretty shocked that Tom <laughs> Keane isn't headed uh, to London. What about you, Liz? Are you working tomorrow? Uh, no, I'll be getting the bunting out, the scones, the jam, and the champagne, Matt. All right. Well, uh, we <laughs> hope you have a fantastic time. Uh, our UK correspondent, Lizzie Burden, there talking about this coronation, which to, to me seems like a gigantic deal, Anna. You're getting. I mean, you have a new king. Hmm. Um, he's going to sit on the oldest piece of furniture still in use today. I think King Edward I's chair from 1200 um, to get this crown put on his head. And I guess he gets a scepter and an orb and all this cool yep. stuff. Aren't you excited? Right, yeah, yeah. well, there'll be a lot of people celebrating. It'll be a national event, something to uh, to enjoy and participate in if you want to. Some people will be protesting, of course, as well. Uh, but and, and a lot of people will just be hoping to enjoy a long weekend. Uh, but interesting point that Lizzie made about the geopolitics, because that has also been a feature of the conversation building up towards this, um, the way that certain people are coming and certain people are not. But, Matt, I think it's time that we reflect on something that is changing on this show. Early edition is not going to be hosted by me and you from next week. You are going elsewhere. That's right. I am uh, no longer going to wake up at 2 in the morning to come in and anchor a 5 a.m. show. I'm shifting my duties to the afternoon, um, which Excellent. I'm excited about. But I will miss you dearly. I will miss Sarah Mazzulli. <laughs> I will miss Matt MacArthur. I will miss... Caitlin Hovelman, all of whom who have done a fantastic job producing this show. And Absolutely. I'm sure you'll be happy with Pretty Gupta in my place. She's going to do an excellent job. Well, I job. very much look forward to working with Chrissy. That will be uh, excellent. But it has been a gloriously unpredictable ride to co-anchor with you, Matt Miller. So I thank you very much for that. That is it for Early Edition. Surveillance is up next with Tom, John and Lisa. They'll keep you focused, of course, on the jobs data. This is Bloomberg.